Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Books My Dad Who Has a PhD in English Literature Thinks I Should Read Because Reading Them Improves My Understanding of Good Literature. Um, also known as Gwen Aimlessly Chatters About Real Literature. So, let's talk about today's real literature. To Be a Pilgrim by Joyce Carey is a sequel, the second book in the trilogy. The last um, Gwen rambles aimlessly about real literature is the second book in the trilogy that starts with herself surprised, which, as you know, I did a few weeks ago, assuming you know this, we're paying attention, um, care at all. Uh, so this book, which was printed complete on permanent book paper, and if I ever understand what permanent book paper is, I'll get back to you all on that. Um, is similar yet different from the first one. This isn't a sequel in that this picks up where the last book left off. This isn't this isn't a sequel in that this is what Tom Wilcher was thinking that time that he spent time with Sarah uh, Jimson back in the other book. This book exists in a series of flashbacks. It starts right where the last book left off in that this starts with Tom Wilcher's perspective immediately following Sarah being arrested for theft and whatever else she was arrested for. And what happens in this book is we get alternatingly, we, we alternate between Tom Wilcher's present when he is an old man and somewhat ill and being cared for by his niece Anne. And it alternates between that and the distant past. Starting early on in this book, it starts with his childhood where he talks about growing up with his sister Lucy, who he both loved because she was shining and brilliant and wonderful and who he periodically hated because there was nobody who could infuriate and anger him more than his sister. He talks in glowing terms about his older brother Edward who is brilliant and a genius and ambitious and a politician and wanting to move forward on this new super democratic England that that they're trying to work towards. This book crosses through the First World War. It ends in the early days leading up to the Second World War. And throughout this book, we see the civil unrest that came about at the turn of the last century, that civil unrest with all of these rights movements, with all of these union movements, with all of these people trying to to revolutionize how government worked, in England in particular, because that is where this book is set. And his brother Edward is, is a politician who is trying to create this new world, to bring about this new world, so on and so forth. And his brother Edward is constantly, has written a lot of, of poetry, a lot of short, a, a lot of short poems and, and supposed epigrams, witty comments. Grace, Lord, I crave, answer thy servant's question. Is this thy grace, I feel, or indigestion? And... And he thinks of his brother as being tremendously witty and clever, and thinks of himself as being less than his sister who has this faith, and his brother who's clever, and his brother Bill who, although not particularly bright, is stolid and calm and a soldier. And, and so frequently in this book, he'll talk about... Uh, about something about, oh, as always, not really prepared. Um, 
if I, you know, bothered to prepare, then I, I would actually have a quote ready. Um, that he'll say things, that you'll have dialogue. Anne will be delighted to see you. She is really a good-natured girl and clever, they say, at her doctoring. Well, Uncle, I certainly found Anne an interesting girl to me, but she didn't seem to take me. She thought me a hick. Not at all. That's only her modern way, etc., and so on. That as he's, as this book is being written from his perspective, not at all, that's only her modern way. Not he said, not, not I stated, not I told him, but that's only her modern way, etc., and so on. So it implies that he said other things of that nature, and yet it's a complete thought. Not at all, that's only her modern way. And he says, he uses etc. a lot. He has these thoughts that that are complete, and yet he, he adds on etc. and so on as though there's more there, as though something else should be there. And there is an argument on one side from my father who recommended this book for this list that he feels that it's about someone who's trying to make himself sound as though he's got more to say. But there's an element of it that is a lack of confidence, an element that is, I'm not smart enough to think of something clever, so fill this in with something clever. But that's only one aspect of this, because religion in this is very important. Religion was very important in the last book as well. Sarah in the last book is is very, very focused on God and finding God in things. But in this book, Tom Wilcher has this, has this faith, but it's a faith where he constantly feels envious of those who have what could be considered greater faith than he does. That that he meets a woman, Julie, who at the time is Edward's mistress, and she's a Catholic, and he admires the strength of her Catholic faith. He admires Sarah's faith. He admires, in some ways, Amy's faith, and the fact Amy is... Amy was Bill's wife. Amy is his sister-in-law, and Amy... Amy is also a calm, cool, phlegmatic... Um, person who is unflappable and just deals with everything as it comes calmly and he admires the faith that she has in in the world in in how things work and when when she dies as she dies you know she says that as she's dying, she says, I'm going now, Tom. Yes, I think that's all, except, oh yes, my summer stays at the cleaners. My dear Amy, for I was shocked that she should waste her last moments in this way. Yes, but there's COD. I don't want Mrs. Biglow to be bothered. She's rather excitable. May, the new season. And that Amy is just like that. And that he admires that she, that her faith did not need theology. Its strong roots were in a character which nothing could shake. That, that she has pride, but it's not vain pride. It's nothing more than the ordinary self-respect which all brave people have by nature. And so he's always... He's bitterly envious of everyone else and very dismissive of his gifts while at the same time exists in a constant state of haranguing everyone because his gifts are that he's not clever. He's not brilliant. What he is is smart in a very pragmatic way. He's somebody who sees how much money you have and how much money you can budget. He's somebody who sees this is how the budgeting and the planning must be done because that's how money works. 
And throughout this book, he feels inadequate. It is made to feel inadequate by his sister Lucy, who runs off to be a pilgrim. And his brother, who goes off to be a politician, and his other brother, who is a soldier, and his mother, who is a Quaker, and... And there's a distinct dislike among all these people for his very flustered pragmatism. And it's not the pragmatism of, you know, day-to-day -day living. It's the pragmatism of smart people, of the highly intelligent. And, you know, it's the pragmatism of a businessman, which, when not abused, can be a valuable thing, can be an important thing. That's why... We have people who do investment banking for those of us who are bad with money. And so, the thing is, this book is, it, it's very, very sad in ways, especially as you reach that final chapter as he lies in bed dying and, and, Thinking over his life, I already read the bit with Amy, but the thing about Amy's death is that Amy is the last one of his generation, the last of his sibling family. His sister Lucy died in her 50s, suddenly and shockingly. His brother Bill died of cancer, slowly and painfully. His mother died, his father had died years and years before his brother Edward, they're all gone. He's the last one left. And Amy was the second last one, the one who died before him. And and in that la the last lines of that chapter, he says that she had arranged for a funeral to Tolbrook and even for the inscription on the stone which marked Bill's grave. And his wife, Amelia Alice, born Madras, India, April 14th, 1871, died. And when the trumpets blew, the walls fell flat. That, that one sentence sits on a line all of its own. And that one sentence speaks to, to his loneliness, to the way that Amy's death is, is kind of a final blow. And this book, it ends, the first chapter, the, the last of this chapter is of him lying in bed, hearing a small boy whistling in the yards on three notes, as he thinks about faith, and what did Amy care for heaven, what do I care so long as I lie in a Tolbrook, in Tolbrook churchyard? And he, and he thinks about, thinks back on his life, thinks about all of the grand ideas, the great ideas, thinks about how throughout his life, I shouted the pilgrim's cry, democracy, liberty, and so forth, but I was a pilgrim only by race. England took me with her on a few stages of her journey because she could not help it. That he feels like he hasn't done anything. It's... It's that death with the regrets of having never done a thing and that he thinks he thinks about England as a whole and the soul of the country, so to speak. And then it finishes up with him talking to Anne that she that he's lying in bed and he's dying and she knows it and he knows it and she says, and he tells her that you take life too seriously. Don't you think it rather serious? My dear child, you're not 30 yet. You have 40, 45 years in front of you. Yes. And that's where the book ends. It, it's very different from the last one, and a lot sadder and a lot more contemplative and a lot more thinky because of that. And I don't really have much else to say 
So I will see you all next week.